Well, whatever ones to shy away from controversy. And when it comes to our favorite shrub that, um, that you could either be planting or even looking for on public land, uh, we have some really strict criteria we want that shrub to fall under. You know, we, we get to see, we get to tour the countryside and tour the country, different whitetail states, uh, dozens of them a year, and really see what's growing best and what's not growing um, best in locations. And really as it relates to not only the soil types and the region, uh, but the shade tolerance levels and certainly the amount of deer browse that one can take. So there's a lot of different things we want to look at. And so you might be thinking about planting something for your property or enhancing something or even getting rid of something. We really want you to watch this video first before making a decision so that you can consider all the factors. Now, number one, there are a lot of great shrubs out there that are wildlife shrubs. You might even see in your local conservation district packets, uh, local tree nursery or shrub nursery that you can see these great shrubs that have these great properties for wildlife. But if deer eat it to the ground, then is it a really good planting? Um, there's a lot of times that someone will say, well, I really want to plant this. I'll so say a red osier dogwood, for example, and it's central Michigan. I want to plant this. And even with moderate deer numbers, deer numbers that are below the carrying capacity of the land, they'll pick on those red osier dogwoods. That doesn't mean that there's too many deer. Far too many game managers, biologists will look at a property and say, oh, they're browsing the red osier dogwood, means you have too many deer. They're browsing the white pine, means you have too many deer. No, it just means it might be by a food source. It might be that there's a lack of food in the area. So they're picking on something they norm don't normally pick on just because they're hungry. And their browsers, they'll eat just about anything. I've seen them dr eat dried oak leaves. They'll just suck them up just because that's their browsers. They're on the way to, they eat poison ivy. They eat all kinds of plants and vegetation that we can't even imagine. They've eaten dried dead fish on the, the shores of Lake Michigan. So there's a lot of things they'll eat, uh, over 400 plants and uh, types of vegetation and habitat that deer will eat. Uh, crazy when you think about it. So when it comes to you know, reintroducing shrubs, trees, habitat on your property, you want to find something that's deer resistant because they will eat it down to the dirt and it could be just they're picking it. I've seen um, uh, moderate deer numbers, Wisconsin property, 28,000 shrubs on 40 acres, or uh, conifers that were planted on 40 acres, and uh, about nine deer based on uh, trail cameras going in there and nipping them in half when they're sticking out of the, the snow over a two week period. It wasn't that it was this great food source, it just that at the time, and it was easy pickings, those, those deer went in and destroyed those plantings uh, pretty quick. Now, again, not that there's too many deer, but you really have to be careful what you plant. Number two, I really like that it's true early successional growth, meaning that you want to reforest an area. This is an early successional growth, a shrub is, and then once hardwood, hardwood grows up around it, it shades it out and eventually kills it. Um, you take like a red cedar. Red cedar will live and get really thin lose lower branches, lose lower needles, and then eventually die under shade. If it's an older one, it might take a little bit longer than a younger one, of course, but um, it does happen. And so I wanna see that with a shrub. I wanna see that it's just a part of the process of early successional growth. That's where that shrub fits in anyways. It's good for all wildlife, meaning it's not just a deer food, it's not just for rabbits, it's not just for grouse, it's not for escape cover for pheasants or for nesting birds. It's for all of them. It's pretty self-explanatory. And if you find that type of shrub on public land, you really want to pay attention to it because whether it's cover for deer, cover for rabbits, food for nesting birds, you're going to find that in that early successional growth upland type setting. And that means it's a very attractive area to hunt, maybe even small game, let alone whitetail on public land or private. Number four, it holds its leaves. I really like when those, those uh, shrubs actually hold their leaves longer into November so that it actually provides true cover during the heart of the season. Far too many plants or trees in general lose their leaves, shrubs or trees, in general lose their leaves and they really don't provide that cover we're expecting. Uh, you can even ex expand that to shrubs used for screening. Um, a lot of shrubs are used for screening and then they lose their leaves and what good are they? You're, you're planting for deer screening but then they lose their leaves in October, November. They don't have provide that cover, they don't provide that screening. So it's not a really good use of your resources to plant. You want it to be thick and sturdy. You don't want it to be spindly. 
to be able to just look right through it because it doesn't have that branch structure. I think one that is a little bit more spindly is a red osier dogwood. If it gets eaten continuously over and over again and, and cut back, it'll grow pretty thick. Uh, speckled elder is another one that you can cut back and get it to grow thicker, but in nature and in its natural environment, it grows pretty spindly and tall or small and delicate as in the case of red osier dogwood. It just really doesn't provide a lot of cover unless you work on it or it's browsed heavily and continues to come back. You want it to be not soil specific. What I mean by that is it'll grow just about any place. Um, you don't have to work at it too hard. I I'm picking a red osier dogwood because I love red osier dogwood as a shrub, but the problem is like deer, ref uh, Dylan refers to it as deer candy. Take a red osier dogwood spring a sprig during the just a little bit of growth during the dead of winter when it's really cold out you can bend it it's flexible you can chew on it it has an apple tea type taste to it it's actually pretty succulent as far as shrubs go a lot of uh like a honeysuckle right now you bite on that it's woody it's hollow it cracks in your mouth it has no flavor where that red osier dogwood is very fine and it is a good shrub i really like it um, but the problem is deer eat it down to the ground. It also, in open settings, it, uh, it still becomes, doesn't become very thick unless you work on it. And then it is very soil specific. And what I mean by that is it needs moist, damp soil. If it's too dry, it dies. If it's too wet and flooded in the spring that you plant it, it dies. It has to have that perfect balance. You can water it, keep it going, get it old, then it's hard to kill. But again, it's, it's a great deer browse shrub, and that's not, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing. You know, we're going to talk about one of my favorite shrubs, and uh, I'll take a little heat for this. It's not one that I would encourage you to plant if you don't already have it, but I think it's important to learn how to manage it, and sh it can become a real hot spot on public land for cover, hiding cover for nesting cover, uh, hiding cover for whitetails, rabbits, grouse, uh, berries for uh, birds. But it's something that you have to watch. Uh, the state used to plant lots of it, um, and that's why we have it in, in the first place in most states, is autumn olive. Now, a lot of people, you know, autumn olive is terrible. There's been people that I know that have taken 20 acres, 40 acres, and it's, they've spent a decade trying to remove it. And the thing about autumn olive is it's here to stay. We're not going to remove it as a whole. I look at it like if you have three or four acres, you want to remove it on the back of your house. Awesome project for you. You want to transform your, your woods. Do something different. Um, always be mindful of the wildlife that are using anything if you're trying to replace it. Always have a replacement, a viable, an appropriate replacement. I know people that have removed autumn olive from their land with no viable replacement for wildlife that was anywhere going to be appreciable in the near future, even 10, 15 years or more because they're planting things like red osier dogwood that gets eaten down to the ground. They're planting something like tag, tag alder that shouldn't be planted in drier soil. Same with the red osier dogwood. So without nine bark, people say, oh, deer don't, deer don't browse it. They do, um, especially just with moderate deer numbers. So there's other alternatives, but at the same time, you're not taking out a 12 foot by 12 foot shrub and replacing it with a 12 foot by 12 foot shrub. And so the wildlife that one shrub supports doesn't necessarily mean that another shrub, even of the same size, is gonna support that same type of wildlife. So you have to be really careful with it. I like autumn olive thickets because you can easily control them, take out half of them, mow half of them down to the ground, create pockets, passageways for deer through them. Deer can utilize them, nesting birds, berry seeking birds, grouse, rabbits, pheasant escape cover, a lot of uses for it. And it fits all of these right here, all, all of this criteria. It's a tough one because you don't want, again, we're not gonna encourage you to plant it. You know, just manage it if you have it. I think it's time now that we look at a lot of this type of habitat and really look at the balance of everything. And I'll give you, um, you know, something we're gonna touch on today is just the overzealousness of CWD control. So we have sharpshooters around my property here in Minnesota right now, not, I don't think on the adjacent property next to us, but within two to three properties, sharpshooting is going on where they're baiting out in open ag fields for deer, and then they shoot them at night with suppressors, 
And last year, I, I get updates from our local police chief, so he keeps me informed because we both don't like what's going on. But he told me 130 deer were killed on one farm alone. It has a devastating effect on the people around. So that's taking a concept. Of course, no one likes CWD. If you want to test for CWD, that's awesome. You know, you have to make regulation change based on CWD. But there's a point and a tipping point where it starts to ruin people's lives, their dreams, their really their passions, um, their investments they have in their land. There's a tipping point at which it can become overzealous and that's where we're entering it right now. And that's the same with autumn olive, where if the states, there's states that have spent millions of dollars to remove autumn olive, um, just to have it continue and flourish, they might have removed 1%, 2%, but they can't make a dent overall. They've even given awards to people that have removed it on 10 acres and now the wildlife have nowhere to go and you killed the wildlife. And that's that tipping point and that balance that to me, you never want to destroy wildlife populations under the guise of removing something that might actually be your best option in the end. There's a lot of alternatives out there. We use um, silky willow, hybrid willows, dappled willow. We get those from big rock trees. Those are really good alternatives that don't spread. You can control them really well. They have good growth rates. They're propagated from, from native species, so it's pretty easy to plant those, get them going. They're not as specific on soil. They might not have the perfect attributes like some shrubs, but they're very, very good. And that's why like big rock trees, they sell out of those every year. They sell cuttings for those. So those are great alternatives. We haven't planted on them out of here. I'm not gonna remove any that are here, but we're not planting any. And at the same time, we have over 200 willows, the hybrid willows, uh, silky willows, all the way up and down our roadside here because it's a great shrub that'll protect some of our pheasants that are out there. Great cover for rabbits, great screening for deer, it grows thick together. So pretty good alternative, but we're not gonna find those silky willows out on public land and hunt in those locations. So good all around shrub, something like an autumn olive is there. We have other things, nine bark, speckled, alber, speckled alder. Nine bark is, is browsed on heavily by deer. We've seen that over and over again. Uh, speckled alder is great, but it needs more moist. Uh, most tag alders, are, they're down to moist, and speckled alder is no exception. It needs moisture ground, so it's hard to plant that out in the open. And it also has more of a spindly shape to it and not, not real thick. Another one, red osier dogwood. I love red osier dogwood. I don't encourage most people to plant it unless they fence it for two to three years, make sure the deer are off of it. And at the same time, you have to go into it knowing that if the area you're putting in that's damp and it floods, they're going to die in, in that first year of planting. If it en ends up being a dry summer, they're going to die unless you water them. So it's very, very finicky. You need it to plant it in damp soil. It needs to stay in damp soil. And that's where you find it naturally and it grows and it can be a really good shrub. I encourage you to cut it, trim it, almost like you would a Christmas tree to make it thicker. So. I hope, I want you to think of some of these as far as, you know, if you're going to replace something with something honeysuckle, a lot of, there's some good honeysuckle repla replacement programs where you work on a little bit at a time, but honeysuckle is something, again, that I've been, at, I was on a lot of properties in Ohio last week, and um, really without honeysuckle on a couple of those properties, it would have had zero cover at all. If they remove that honeysuckle within that hardwood overstory, then nothing else is gonna grow in its place unless they take the hardwood out, which I recommend that they do. But it's, you have to be very careful with some of these that if you go hog wild or removing it, really think about what it's doing to your local wildlife. So one of the consistent shrubs we see over and over again that stands the test of time, and it does get shaded out and killed eventually by hardwood, so it doesn't take over hardwood plantings, is autumn olive. And there's others of these that are more honorable mentions and uh, Dylan, you had a couple that um, you had mentioned too when you're out on properties recently. You found a, a different one that uh, was, leather, well, a couple that you. Leatherleaf was one that, I mean, it was ridiculous. Every time I came across it, I was like, what is this? Trying to figure out, you know, it's tough because it's browsed down so far. So it just goes to show how much the deer really enjoy eating it. But uh, then uh, I, when I'm out east, I've run into burning bush quite a bit. And that's another one where, for whatever reason, out east, every time I come across it, it's like, man, they are loving this, eating the heck out of it. And I think it, it must fit out east well, but it was. I think most of that comes from neighborhood plantings for ornamental shrubs because it is a non-native. And I bet you that's where it, for, it is beautiful, actually. Both to the two places that I can recall it specifically were like just outside of a development. 
So. Yeah, I can see that taking place. It's crazy the amount of different habitat types that we see. Um, it was interesting. I'll just end with this. I had a, somebody who was a park uh, ranger. Um, he's a ranger within the park. He worked on a lot of invasive control there. And he was telling me that it was interesting because they, uh, a non-native will change the biology of the soil. But at the same time, that biology of the soil now supports other wildlife or other habitat types that weren't supported before. And he said, it's hard to create a balance where you look at it. He said, none of these just destroy the soil. It just changes the soil. And he said that might not be a bad thing where now this habitat and this soil type supports something that's rare and endangered over here that this native didn't support. And I'm not saying that we need to add non-natives to make all these experience, experiments, but the point is, and he actively removes these uh, non-natives as best as he can. That's his mission. But at the same time, to do it on a huge, large scale, probably not appropriate. Uh, the millions of dollars that are spent are not appropriate and who knows it actually might support a greater level of wildlife and a different type of wildlife that's still rare and endangered no different than what it's replacing supported on the other side so i think it's time whether it's cwd some of these uh, ornamental shrubs non-native varieties there's some that are terrible um they get into an area that uh that just won't go away and i'm thinking kudzu down down south it's a huge browse for deer during the winter time. I mean, they, they can support ungodly numbers of deer and it's a huge amount of food, but it takes over the entire landscape. And there's other things, especially down south, that are really, really bad. Like bush honeysuckle is one thing, but when you get into titarian honeysuckle and some of these um, really strong non-natives, like a bush honeysuckle is more like a native honeysuckle or acts similar in some ways it's more aggressive though but some of these the japanese and titarian honeysuckle can be horrible and spread very very fast so um, always be careful don't plant non-natives but uh, learn about them and always look for a replacement and a viable replacement if you are replacing and look at taking small chunks away first so you're ultimately you're not hurting the wildlife in your area hope this makes sense Consider some of these factors and go on to your property a little bit more informed uh, based on some experience and make good decisions going forward this year. Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to, this is a bedding area stand, this is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.